Welcome to the Peace Haven Weekly Podcast. Weekly message audio from Peace Haven Baptist Church in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. We continue our study in Romans, with this sermon entitled, Is the Law Sin? We thank you for listening and be sure to visit us at www.findpeace.today. As I was studying this week, I thought uh, about a time my dad did something that was probably uh, not the smartest thing, but uh, I was learning how to drive, and I had my my permit, and it was approaching the time when I was going to get my my license, and so uh, I was driving back home from a friend's house, and my dad was in the passenger seat, and we were going down the road, and all of a sudden, he just reaches over, and he yanks the wheel to pull me off the road into like the ditch off the shoulder. And he did that uh, to see how I would react, how I would respond to that. And, and you know, in, in driver's ed class, they kind of tell you that when you kind of are, are going into a ditch or you've run off the road, that you need to uh, don't slam on the brakes, don't, you know, counter steer and, and, and do that really hard or you'll end up in the other ditch. And so what you do is you kind of decelerate, take your, your foot off the gas, and you kind of slowly correct yourself and, and get yourself back onto the road. And um, I guess Dad had enough confidence in me to, to figure I would do that, and we didn't wreck. So it, it, it ended up well. But um, I, I look back on that and think, I didn't do that with Corbin. I wasn't brave enough. Um, so, but anyway, I, I, I passed his test. Um, but this morning, uh, I was reminded of that and thought about that this week because it, that's kind of what Paul is doing with us uh, in this part of, of Romans chapter 7. Um, he wants to make sure that we understand something about God's law. And so there are two ditches that, that Paul wants us to avoid, two approaches to the law uh, that he, he wants us not to have. Uh, in our understanding of, of who God is and, and what uh, salvation is. And, and the first ditch or the, the first approach is believing that the law can make us right with God. And he has, uh, Paul has spent a lot of time kind of bringing this to our minds and making us aware of this, that, that my behavior, that your behavior, uh, your deeds are not what makes us uh, right with God. Our, our, our behavior does not earn God's approval. And so uh, keeping God's law uh, does not override uh, the fact that we have, have broken His law. And so Paul says uh, a lot of things about that. He, he said in verse two, or chapter 2, verse 12, all who sin under the law are judged by the law. In 2.23 he says, you who boast in the law, you've, you've broken it. In 3.20 he says, By works of the law no flesh will be justified. And then also in 3.20 he says that the law uh, brings awareness of our sin. And so in the real world, kind of out there, uh, we can see that, right? Like we have laws in our society, um, traffic laws, uh, laws regulating speed, and um, laws about certain activities that are prohibited. And those laws and, and the, the police, uh, police officers, don't really make good people. Um, Scott will tell you, you're, you're catching the bad guys, right? It, you're not creating good people. You might hinder them for a time, and, and they'll say, well, we'll come back when nobody's watching uh, so we can break the law. But really, the, the job of the, the, the police officer is not, they're, they're not creating good people they're just catching the bad guys. And so we can, we can see how the law points to our sin. It reveals the sinfulness uh, of our lives. And so the, that's the first uh, kind of ditch that Paul wants us to avoid. And the second ditch, uh, or the second approach that he wants us to avoid is being uh, totally uh, against the law. Uh, and this is the idea that the, the law serves no purpose anymore. Now that we are, uh, as he has said, under grace... And so in light of, of last week, we can see why people would come to that conclusion. Uh, Paul has rightly said that we are, are justified by faith. We're made right with God 
We have an escape. Uh, we're, we're made right with God through faith and, and what Jesus has done for us. Where, where we can't keep the law. Jesus was perfectly obedient um, and perfectly fulfilled the law of God. And then where we have broken the law and sinned against God, uh, Jesus died to, to take that penalty for us being lawbreakers. And so in 328, he says we're justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And so, again, we, we trust and receive what Jesus has done for us by faith. In 7.4, he says we have died to the law to be joined to another. And then in 7.6, he says we are released from the law. We talked about that last week, um, that we no longer serve in the way of the, the written code, uh, but now we serve in the new way of the Spirit. And so, just to kind of quickly summarize where we've been the past few weeks, um, we said that those who are, are baptized in Christ, those who have been born again, we have a, a new identity uh, in Christ. We're, we're clothed in Christ's righteousness. And so we are, are free in Christ from the obligations and demands of the law. And we said that we, we must be because the law cannot save us. And so we, we must be free from those requirements and those obligations because if, if salvation hinges on my obedience at all, if it hinges on your obedience to God's law at all, then we would forfeit our salvation uh, because we, we can't keep it. And so we talked about that freedom uh, that we have in Christ. Uh, but in that freedom, we said we're, we're given a new framework. And so now the Holy Spirit lives inside of us as believers. Um, he teaches us. He gives us counsel. He gives us guidance. And He produces fruit uh, that leads to sanctification. Uh, he, he leads us on a new path, a, a new way of, of living. And we said that, uh, you know, really if we, we talked about this and said, well, since we're not under the law, can we live any way we want to? And we said the answer to that is shockingly yes, but God changes our want to. And so that, that's key of last week. And so that, that fruit that is being produced in us by the Spirit uh, we talked about how the law couldn't produce that. And so we look at the Ten Commandments and say, well, I, I, I can live my whole life and never murder anyone, but that doesn't make me peaceful. And we can live our whole life and, and not bear false witness against our neighbor, but that doesn't mean we've been kind to our neighbor. We can live our, our whole life and never steal, but that doesn't mean that we have been loving. And so this uh, fruit that the Spirit produces is something that the law is, is not able to produce. And so um, after all of that talk about what the, the law can't do, uh, Paul now has to kind of slow down and make sure that we uh, aren't in a ditch. And so he's going to answer another question this morning. And, and what he's actually doing is he's, he's going to defend or, or vindicate the law. And so uh, for the kids this morning... And get my water. Maybe I'll set it up here closer to me. For the kids this morning, our word is going to be law. So I hope you have a, one of those clickers ready, Shannon, because we'll be saying this a lot. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, but when we think about God's law, we, we think about uh, the Ten Commandments, or we think about... Um, in the Jewish mindset, we would think about the whole Torah, the first five books of, of the Bible. And so it's important that we understand that God's law has a purpose. And so Paul is going to be talking about the, the purpose of the law this morning. And so in Romans 7, we'll pick up in verse 7, it says, What then shall we say? The, that the law is sin? Paul says, By no means, for if it had not been for the law... I would have not known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me, for sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy 
And the commandment is holy and righteous and good. And so the question that Paul asks this morning is, should we conclude that the law is sinful in light of everything that he has uh, just said? Should we call God's law, should we put it in the category of sinful or bad um, or say that the law is is useless now? And a lot of people uh, treat God's law that way. Uh, they might say things like, well, that's that's old, um, that's archaic, that's uh, that no longer applies to us. We've moved beyond that. Uh, or they say, well, we, we, we really don't need all of those laws. What we really need to do is just love each other. And so since we are New Testament believers, we can kind of jettison the law. We can disregard it. Um, and the, so the question that he's answering is, is that really the case? And so listen to how Paul speaks uh, about the law. Verse 1. He says, is the law sinful? Is the the law bad? Simple answer, by no means. Verse 12, he says, the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Verse 14, he says that uh, we know that the law is spiritual. And that should be kind of like a hyperlink to the things that we talked about last week. So the the law is spiritual. So this is has something to do with the Holy Spirit. And so we need to to seek that out. Uh, Verse 16, he says, I agree with the law that it is good. In verse 22, he says, I delight in the law of God in my inner being. And so this doesn't sound like someone who is saying, well, good riddance to the law. We need to be done with all of that. And so how is the law holy? How is it righteous? How is it good? Um, And so this morning we're going to use those three words to to think about uh, the three purposes of the law. And and hopefully that will... uh, clarify for us what Paul is is trying to communicate uh, this morning. And so first, Paul says that the law is holy. And so uh, here we're going to kind of revisit a principle that we talked about when we did our study uh, in Exodus. And that principle is that the law uh, reveals the lawgiver. It reveals the heart of the lawgiver. And so uh, Psalm 119 Verse 2, uh, Psalm 119 is, if you remember, it, it's one of the, the longest uh, chapters in the Bible. It's the, the longest psalm. And the whole psalm is about God's law, His Word, His instruction, uh, and just thanking God and talking about uh, the goodness of His law. And the psalmist says, Blessed are those who keep His testimonies who seek Him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in His ways. And so the psalmist is saying that that the law, God's Word, His instructions to us, uh, are His testimonies uh, about Himself. The law reveals who God is, about His nature, His character. And so when we think about the Ten Commandments, uh, you think about the, the first few commandments, we learn that there is only one God. There is one true God, and there is no other God beside Him. We learn that God's name is to be honored and revered, that His uh, Word should have weight and authority in our lives. When He talks about keeping the Sabbath, we, we talked about this in the Exodus uh, in more detail, but uh, when He talks about the, keeping the Sabbath, we, we learn that God gives us rhythms of, of work and rest in our lives. And um, Scott was talking about we're, we're fragile people. We were talking about an accident this morning. And, and I'm thankful God knows that we're fragile. And so He gives us those rhythms of, of work and rest. And, and so we, we have this work week where we uh, labor and, and we may... Um, have strenuous work, and then he he says, okay, you you need a day to rest, not only from your labor, but to rest in me. And remember, I'm the one that is providing for you. I'm the one that that gives you life. I'm the one that uh, sustains you. Um, And then uh, when we look at the commandment of of do not murder, uh, we learn that that God is the God of of life and death, that he's the one that that gives life uh, and takes away. Um, when we think about the, the law of do not commit adultery, uh, we're told that, that God is a faithful God. Uh, and just like we're supposed to be uh, faithful in our marriages, God is faithful to His promises and His people, His covenant. Uh, we learn that 
God is our provider, again, that all things are, are His, and so uh, we're just stewards of what He has given us or what He has loaned to us. And so we think about that in uh, response to the commandment of, of do not steal. Uh, and then in bearing false witness, uh, when we think about that, we, we learn that God is a God of truth, that He is wise, that His Word is, is trust, trustworthy. Um, and so all of that is is pretty straightforward and, and kind of easy to follow, hopefully. Um, but this leads me to the, the second purpose of the law, uh, that we, you and I, were, were made as image bearers of God. We're made in His image and likeness. And so we are supposed to uh, think as God does, desire what God desires, and act in accordance to His character and purpose. Uh, but we fall short of that. We, we walk our, our own Path. We, we don't walk in His ways, as the, the psalmist is saying, blessed is the person that walks in His, his ways, but we, we don't do that. Uh, we sin against God. And so Paul says that the law is righteous. Uh, it reveals the, the standard or the expectation. We can think of it that way. If we're, we're made as image bearers of God, then God has this expectation of our behavior and our desires and our thinking. Uh, that we fail to live up to. And so Paul says, had it not been for the law, I, I would not have known sin. And he isn't saying that he would not have had a, a sense of, of right and wrong. He's already talked about that. As, uh, he talks about our conscience condemning us earlier in Romans. Um, but he is saying that we, we, all, we all have that sense of what is right and what is wrong. We all make judgments every day of our life. Uh, but what he what he's saying here is now because the the law has come because he has seen the law he he knows that that guilt that we feel uh, when our conscience condemns us that that's not just guilty feelings that we have uh, but that's that's real guilt we are really guilty um, before a holy God and so God's law is is like a mirror revealing our our blemishes our sins our our brokenness so. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had one of those em embarrassing uh, kind of uh, dinner moments. Maybe you're out with work or out with some friends and someone looks at you and says, um, I, I don't know if you, you know this, uh, but you have a big pimple right here. And it looks like Mount Vesuvius is like on your forehead. And, and so you, you get up and you go uh, to the restroom and you look in the mirror and you're like, wow, how did I miss that? And, and what do I... What do I do about it? Uh, and so you go to the mirror and you, you look at that and you can see uh, that blemish that something is, is wrong. And Paul says that is, that's the law. Uh, it, it reveals our sin, our rebellion, uh, our brokenness. And, and our brokenness is uh, much more than, than skin deep. Uh, it's deep with, within us. Uh, our sin is not just about what we do. It's not just about our actions, um, but our, our desires. Are, are corrupt. Our thinking is, is shameful. And we know that. Um, and it's because we have that, that sinful nature uh, that he has talked about, that, that connection to Adam, that natural inclination to sin. And so Paul says in verse 7, For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. And so he says, does, does the law make us sin? No, it, it's not the law's fault. We sin because we're sinners. Our, our sinful nature uh, is in action here. Uh, and we've probably heard this example before. Uh, I know we've used it in Sunday school class, but um, you think about the, the wet paint sign. Uh, when you see a, a wet paint sign, what, what do you want to do? You want to touch whatever it's on, right? A and the question is, is why? Why do you do that? Um, so why, why do we do that? I, I think a lot of people would answer, well, I, I want to see if it's still wet, right? I want to see if, if the paint's still wet, so I'm going to touch it to see if it's dry. Um, and let me kind of flip that and say, Another way we could, we could say what you've just said is I want to see if the sign is telling the truth. Right? 
That's what we're really wanting to know. Is this being truthful to me or is it deceiving me? And that's what our sin nature does, guys. When, when we look at what God has said, this is the best way to live. This is how I designed you for flourishing. This is the, the best life you can have. I'm, I'm telling you how to have that. Our sinful nature says, really? Is that really what's best? Is God really being truthful with me? And, and, and that's what happened in the garden, right? That this, that's what started the whole thing. Is Adam and Eve thinking, well, you know, that, that looks good to my eyes. It, it looks like I can eat that and everything's going to be okay. And the serpent deceiving them and say, saying, did, did God really say that? You know, you, you really can't trust God. He, he's trying to hold you back from something that you will enjoy. He's trying to, to hold you back from something good. That, that's our sinful nature. That's what it, it, it tells us. It gets into our ear and, and talks to us. I thought about um, as a, a parent or when I was younger growing up, my parents, uh, I know my mom, she would, uh, on Sunday mornings when we would get ready for church, and if it was raining outside, uh, I would say, well, I'm going to go outside. And she would say, well, don't be jumping in the puddles, right? We've, we've all told kids that. And, and as a child, the way my brain worked, um, I would say, yes, mom, I will be obedient to you, mom. I will not jump in the puddle. But you didn't say I couldn't do that. Or you didn't say I couldn't jump, try to jump over the puddle. And, and I was always husky, so I couldn't jump hard, very far. So, um, but but that, that's what we do, right? We, we want to flirt with that boundary and the edges of, of sin. Uh, we want to focus on the externals. And God is looking at our heart. And so we'll say, well, I didn't do that. But there's no problem with me thinking about it. And God is, is looking at our heart. And this is why Paul uses coveting here to show us something. Um, all of the other commandments are, are external. It's something that you, you do. But coveting is, is inside. It's, it's internal. It's about our heart. It's about our, our nature. Um, and that's where the real problem is. Our, our disordered desires... And so we, we might keep the external, we might keep the, the letter of the law, uh, but internally we're, we're desiring things that are contrary to, to God. We, we Actually, the, the word for covet here is a, a very strong word. It's, it's kind of like a, a lust. Um, we crave uh, those sinful things. And so we may not commit adultery, uh, but inside we, we may entertain fantasies. Uh, we may watch screens. But we're, you know, we're, we haven't really committed the act, but we're watching filth on TV that we shouldn't be watching. We may not murder someone, but that doesn't stop us from wishing uh, some kind of catastrophe or, or disaster would happen to them, or really hating them in our heart. We may not lie, but we will uh, bend the truth, or we'll leave out details that work out in our favor. Paul is, is talking about God looking at our heart. Paul says, I, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. And most people, and I, I agree with the commentaries here, that Paul uh, is beginning to be very personal and autobiographical here and throughout the rest of chapter 7 that we'll talk about next week. But Paul says, I, I was once alive, but when the commandment uh, came that, that, that it killed me. And, and what he's probably talking about here is his uh, bar mitzvah. You know, in, in Jewish culture, they have a, a bar mitzvah once you get a, a certain age. And really what that means, bar mitzvah, it means under law, under commandment. And so at a certain age, uh, the, the child says, yes, I, I've, I've read, the, I've been taught the law, I've been taught, you know, the, the Torah, and I'm old enough to understand that, and I'm placing, uh, I'm, I'm old enough to be placed under that law. And so uh, it's an age where you, you know the law, and you're responsible for that. And 
Paul says, what I found is this law that was supposed to be really good. It, it, it led to me dying because it, it revealed that I'm not good. This law that is good revealed that I'm not good. And so uh, the law revealed and drew attention to Paul's sinful nature. And in doing that, it, it revealed his need for a Savior. And, and so this is what he's, he's getting at here is um, the, the law is, is a lot like an x-ray. And so if you uh, break your arm and you go to, to get that x-ray and, and they look at it and say, okay, we can see the, the problem here. Uh, we see which bone is, is broken. This is why you're having pain. Uh, there's a problem with your arm. You, you don't take the x-ray and wrap it around your arm to fix it, right? You, you, you can't do that. It, it doesn't do anything for you. It just shows you the problem. You, you need a, a surgeon or a doctor, someone that can restore what is, is broken. And Paul's saying that that's the purpose of the law. It's to show us that we are sinners that we need forgiveness from a holy God because we, we stand under His condemnation. And so we need someone to, to fix that. We need someone to fix what we can't fix ourselves. And just as a, a side note, um, here is where we run into danger when we say, well, let's just love people. Because most of the time when, when people say that, they, they mean something different. A lot of times when people say, well, we just need to, to love people, uh, what they really mean is, I, I want you to accept my sin. I want you to affirm me how I am. I want you to celebrate my sin. And what they're, they're saying is, let's get rid of the law and, and just love everybody. In reality, they're, they're really saying, let's, let's get rid of the rules because if there are no rules, I'm no longer a rule breaker. If, if there is no judge, then I can't be pronounced guilty. And that's dangerous, guys. It, it's dangerous. Yes, we should love people. And we must love people by pointing out sin, by pointing out that we're broken. Not that, listen to me. Not that they're broken, but we're broken. Not their sin, but we are all sinners. And we don't have to do that looking down our nose at someone. We can do that with a gentle spirit. Because we, the whole thing, we have received grace. We didn't deserve it. And God loves those people. He, he does. He loves them enough that He sent His Son to die for them their sins so they can be forgiven and put on a new path. But there is a new path. And so we have to, to keep all of that in balance. This is staying out of those ditches. So finally, Paul says that the law is good. That it's beneficial. That it has positive qualities for us. And this is important when we think about the law reflecting God's character, who He is, because d does God ever change? No. He's the same yesterday and today and tomorrow forever. And so the law still reflects who God is. And therefore it still reflects who we're supposed to be. It reflects whose image we're supposed to, to bear. And Jesus, when He was on earth, He says, I, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fill it. And so He was perfectly obedient, and He was without sin, and He kept the law for us. And that's the righteousness that we receive by faith. He, he's accomplished that for us, and we receive that righteousness. But at the same time, guys, whose image are we supposed to be conformed to? The image of the Son, by the power of the Spirit. And so that's why Paul says, and we'll see this next week, that the law is spiritual. That it comes from, that it pertains to the Spirit. And so we can say, well, Jesus said to love God and to, to love people. Well, can we, can we really say that the law doesn't show us how to do that? That's the second ditch, that the law doesn't help us anymore. Wouldn't loving God be like 
not having other things in our life that we, we put before Him? Wouldn't loving God be not dishonoring His name and, and how we live as His children? And then if we talk about loving people, what does that look like? Well, wouldn't it look like not murdering someone? Wouldn't it look like valuing, valuing them as a person, as a, another image bearer of God? Wouldn't it look like not stealing from them? Being willing to help those in need. Wouldn't it look like not committing adultery and, and being faithful in our marriage and our commitment to, to loving and serving our, our spouse? And so God's law is, is still very valuable for the believer because God doesn't change. And so while we, we can't be made right by the law, that, that's true. Uh, and we are released from the obligation and the duty of the law. That's true. But as God transforms us, we will delight in the law because we delight in God. And the law says who God is. That, that's the key. So He has given His law for a purpose. And we talked about those purposes this morning, that the law reveals who God is, His, His holiness, His character. It reveals our need for a Savior, that we're broken, that we're fallen. And it reveals God's best way uh, to live. It reveals His path for us. And, and so uh, the difference now is we have the Holy Spirit who, who doesn't just teach us the, the letter of the law, but He expands it. He, he moves into the internals, into our desires, into the heart. And so hopefully uh, we can agree uh, this morning with Paul that the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank You uh, for Your Word. And um, I just pray that something said this morning uh, as we listen and as You teach us, it will um, motivate us to image You well, to share the Gospel with other people, um, to be thankful for the grace that we have in, in Your Son and what He has done for us on the cross. And God, we just thank You for all that You're doing in the lives of Your people. And um, we just thank You for Your Word. Thank You most of all for Your Son and, and what He has purchased for us. And uh, help us to image our Savior. Not because we have to do that to be saved, but because we're, we're so thankful for the salvation that we have and because we delight in You and see... Uh, your beauty and your wisdom and your love. God, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.